To date, Arrow has found no verifiable evidence for claims that the U.S. government or private companies have access to or have been reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. Extraterrestrial technology it has been one of the greatest conspiracy theories going back to the 1940s. Is the U.S. government hiding crashed extraterrestrial ships and dead alien bodies? Well, today the Pentagon says they looked into it. Their answer is a hard no. There are still some things they can't explain. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. Hello, and welcome back to us diving into that age-old question of are we alone in the universe? Remember that wild testimony on Capitol Hill last summer, the one where a former intelligence officer told Congress that the U.S. government was involved in a cover-up and was in possession of crashed UFOs and had been working to reverse alien tech and even had recovered alien bodies? I was informed in the course of my official duties of a multi-decade uh, UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering program. Do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Um, were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human. Uh, so that definitely caught the attention of lawmakers who pretty quickly passed some legislation telling the Pentagon, you need to seriously look into all this and report back to us. And today, we finally have seen the first report due to Congress that details the history of UFOs and the United States government and a whole bunch of classified government programs dating all the way back to the 1940s. Their conclusion, no evidence of crash retrievals, but that conclusion doesn't tell the whole story. Here's a quick recap of how we got here. Tonight, eight months after that out-of-this-world testimony on Capitol Hill. Were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human. The official word from the Pentagon, no dead alien bodies, no crashed alien craft, and no government cover-up. In a 63-page report, the DOD's UAP office saying they've interviewed more than 30 people, including heads of aerospace companies, CIA and defense officials, and found no credible first-hand information supporting the claims. Any validity to any of the crash retrieval uh, talk that was presented to Congress or the fact that the United States may have, you know, alien craft? Yeah, we've seen absolutely no evidence of that to date. Also detailed, the government's long history with UFOs going back to the 40s, even touching on former President Bill Clinton's interest in Roswell. But the DOD insisting that was a mix of confusion over high-altitude test dummies, fatal plane crashes, and a program to detect nukes. What we found is that claims of hidden programs are largely the result of circular reporting by a small group, repeating what they heard from others. But when it comes to some of the recent mysteries involving pilots or surveillance video, the report was short on specifics. The report's response to the UFO hype, a long list of earthly explanations, saying there was no evidence of extraterrestrials, but a small percentage of cases had potentially anomalous characteristics or concerning characteristics. Anomalous and concerning, a.k.a. a lot of those big question marks are still out there. So let's bring in Ryan Graves, a former Navy pilot and the co-founder of the Americans for Safe Aerospace. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us again. We were talking a little bit earlier. Does this report address what you and your squadron were seeing flying out there on the East Coast? Well, no. This report that was released by the Aero Office is a historical look going back to about 1940 and onward. Uh, the cases that we experienced in the 2014 to 2015 period off the coast of Virginia Beach and Florida uh, were not addressed, and we still don't know what those objects were. Uh, reports are still coming in from the eastern seaboard and elsewhere that pilots are experiencing objects today, now, that we're not really sure what they are, and they have been demonstrating, as this report used, concerning performance characteristics. And Ryan, as I understand it, there are two reports that are due to Congress. One was supposed to look at things that happened from the 1940s to 2023. Your incidents fall into that. The, the Nimitz incident in 2004 off the coast of California, that falls into that. Those, I didn't see anything about that in the report. Is, is there any possibility that what you saw may be addressed in the next report that's supposed to come out? 
That's a possibility, uh, but you're absolutely right. It does uh, not include any of the more modern cases that have been judicially considered uh, unexplained. Uh, in the 2018 time period, if we recall, or excuse me, 2017 period, the, there was a couple of videos that were released by the New York Times, one labeled the gimbal and another the go fast. These were the cases on the Eastern seaboard and there it is there. That still remain unexplained at this time. And Brian, you know, how quickly the public forgets, but you were there the day that Grush testified. I remember there were two different issues brought to Congress that day that we were watching for. One, the testimony of you and other pilots like David Fravor about seeing things in the sky that you couldn't explain. And then there was this whole crash retrieval stuff. And the way I remember it, as soon as people heard someone tell Congress about like non-biologics, it almost seemed like whatever had been happening now uh, was totally overshadowed by what may have happened or or may not have happened in the past. Do you think that's kind of what's happening in this report? No, I, I do agree with that. You know, it, it's disappointing. The language in this report is really detrimental to people that want to come forward, witnesses, potential whistleblowers, and also commercial and military pilots that are dealing with this and are fighting through the stigma in order to report these cases. There is pending legislation now uh, within Congress in order to enable pilots, commercial pilots would be able to report on UAP without fear of repercussions. And you can learn more about that at safeaerospace.org. But this type of report, all it does is diminish the conversation and it does not leave many options for pilots that have to deal with this now. Uh, it's really interesting, kind of ironic, because like so much of this was about reducing the stigma of just being able to talk about seeing something weird and trying to figure out what it was. I know this is just volume one of what's due to Congress. Uh, what comes next based on the people that you've been talking to? Well, we have to remember the headlines on this story aren't necessarily telling the full full report. In the report, it also does mention that they are taking care to be able to deploy sensors at various bases to better understand what the UAP are. So in one hand, they are dismissing the historical context and any potential illegal programs. However, they are taking care to invest in the technology so we can better understand this going forward. So to answer your question, I think the government will likely continue to investigate this, and I encourage the public to keep the pressure on as well. I'm so glad you brought that up. This is, that, for me, that's the most fascinating thing, the, the, the gremlins, um, these pelican cases that, from what we understand, the DOD has been testing out. They're packing them full of sensors, and these are supposed to be rapidly deployed to any hotspot of UFO activity. And that's something that we know is going to happen. What kind of sensor, what, what, what will they be looking for? Yeah, I think, you know, what they'll be looking for, uh, what we call things outside the normal pattern of life. Uh, using hyperspectral sensors, you can look outside the normal visual range and you have the potential to be able to see objects that are moving or producing energies that we would otherwise not normally be able to see optically. And so by putting these sensors out there, they have the opportunity to catch some of these uh, UAP in action and potentially better understand what they are. Uh, it is a problem right now. We do not have the proper reporting mechanisms. The uh, ICIG uh, has said that themselves. And so as we continue to better understand what this is, I think that arrow should leave the door open to at least understanding what these are without putting assumptions about their locations, uh, such as being off world or potentially extraterrestrial. We can all agree that there's something there and it's responsible for us to be able to know what's flying over our heads within the United States. And if you, if you would just level with me from what you've seen, do you think this is part of a cover-up of a cover-up, or do you think Arrow is truly interested in, in getting to the bottom of all this? Well, I think if they were truly interested in getting to the bottom of this, there would be more resources and more time put forward in order to, to understand the historical context. Ultimately, the only way that people are going to be satisfied with the answer that's given by the Pentagon, Arrow, or another office is if there's transparency around the conversation. That's good governance, and we haven't seen that yet. Uh, hopefully more transparency follows. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us. And the future of TikTok as we know it is at risk here in the United States. The company is trying to fight back against a bill that would ban TikTok in the U.S. unless the company cuts ties with its Chinese owners. And the way that it all seems to be going down is pretty rare. Both Democrats and Republicans just came together on a powerful congressional committee to write a bill that tells TikTok either sell or get banned in the United States. And it's all prompted TikTok to try to call on their most loyal fans to try to come to its defense. Well, yesterday, they sent out 
a push notification. You might have seen it. It was ahead of a key vote, and they told people to call their Congress members and to ask them to vote against the bill. Lawmakers say their phones were going off the hook, but it looks like it might have backfired. Take a look. Tons, tons. We had kids, we had little children calling into our office and others basically saying questions like, what is Congress? What is a congressman? Can I have my TikTok back? That proved the point of why people wanted to pass the legislation. The fact that they used geolocation targeting to go after minor children to call congressional offices with misinformation about the bill caused so many members on the ENC committee to vote in favor of the bill. Uh, lawmakers voted unanimously to move that bill through, and NBC News anchor Savannah Sellers joins us now. Savannah, what is a Congress? What is a congressman? I mean, these questions are pretty wild. TikTok says this is a total ban. Lawmakers are saying, no, it's not. There's nuance here. Is this a ban or not? Got it. Great question. And first, I just do want to tell you anecdotally, I've spent the day talking to TikTokers who did make those calls to their congressperson. And I actually did ask one of them, did you ever think you'd be calling your congressperson about any type of issue? And she started cracking up laughing. And she said, no, I had no idea. I wouldn't have known how. So to that point, it definitely was unusual action that a lot of these people were taking spurred on. Certainly, they will admittedly say so by TikTok and by getting that notification. But that is such a good question that you asked me, Gotti. Is it a ban? Is it not a ban? And look, I'm just going to say it, it's 2024, right? We are in an election year, so nothing is not about politics, right? What this sort of seems to be in terms of this little kind of nuance here on that language is essentially no one wants voters to be upset about something, especially at a time like this, right? Congress doesn't want a bunch of American voters thinking they were the reason that their, this app was taken away from them, something that they loved in the case of a lot of TikTokers, their livelihood. So they want to say, this is not a ban. This is up to TikTok. TikTok, meanwhile, did say in their statement today, I'll read you the exact language. It said, this legislation has a predetermined outcome, a total ban of TikTok in the United States. So as you mentioned, that is, in fact, what they're calling it. Really, what's going on, though, is what Congress is calling for is a divesture. They are calling on ByteDance, this parent company that has these Chinese ties, to sell TikTok. And then, hey, there's no ban. But of course, if they do not actually do that, then yes, the outcome here is technically a ban effectively, I should say, a ban of TikTok. I got to say it, like most Americans that I know, they they don't care about their user data. Uh, they don't really read the uh, user uh, agreements when you're signing up for a new social media app. Uh, do we have any way of knowing whether or not the Chinese government actually has access to some of this user data? And, and what is the risk here? It's a great question, Gotti. Every TikToker I talked to the day, by the way, does not care about that. I asked. I said, you know, this whole thing is happening because of the concern of your data and it potentially getting in the hands of the Chinese government. They don't care. A lot of them pointed to the fact, hey, I just say out loud, you know, I need to buy my son's shoes. And all of a sudden, ads for shoes are popping up on every app. So to the average consumer, right? It's like, well, I don't know. It's kind of like the, the trains left the station on my data just belonging to me. It's out there. It's everywhere. Why is this one app that I really love such an issue? And of course, as you point out smartly, it is that tie to China. Now, TikTok denies that the Chinese government has actually had any access to this. They say they are an independent company. In fact, I'll tell you, I was on the Hill last year when the CEO was on the Hill and he was totally grilled by lawmakers. And in response, he said, I have seen no no evidence that the Chinese government has access to that data. They have never asked us. He was responded to by somebody saying that's preposterous sounding to me. He claims they have not. They have admitted, of course, they do have data like other apps do, just like the fact that, for example, they did geolocate people and send you directly to your congressperson, the correct one for your district. That being said, though, it, the question remains, what could happen with the Chinese government? Could they compel TikTok to turn over data? And is there any way for us to know if that has happened? TikTok denies that. Savannah Sellers, thanks so much for joining us. And we are following breaking news near the Texas border. Authorities say a National Guard helicopter has crashed there, killing at least two people and leaving at least four others hurt. Now, this happened in a small town near the Rio Grande River. We're working to find out what led to that crash, and we're going to bring you updates as soon as we get them. President Biden is officially on the campaign trail today, stopping in Philadelphia just one day after that State of the Union address, and a lot was riding on last night for Biden, and he hit on all the things Americans are talking about, the economy, abortion, Israel and Gaza, and yes, his age. When it came to the topic of immigration, he went back and forth with Republicans in the chamber. Take a listen. 
Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of the thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. That was Biden referring to Lakin Riley there, a 22-year-old nursing student who police say was killed by an undocumented immigrant in Georgia last month. Her murder has been a rallying cry for conservatives pushing for stricter immigration policies. One person who's been dealing with the crisis at the border, even stirring up controversy along the way himself, is Texas Governor Greg Abbott. And NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez spoke with him one-on-one -on -one to talk about his immigration enforcement and his take on Biden's address. At the center of the border battle is Texas Governor Greg Abbott, repeatedly taking on the Biden administration, which he says caused the crisis. There's a number one issue in America, and that's securing the border. It's an issue on which uh, he has failed. We spoke with him late today in Austin. On a scale of one to ten, how would you rate President Biden's State of the Union address? I give it an F for failure. The governor fiercely opposes the bipartisan border security bill that President Biden is calling out Republicans for killing. We can fight about fixing the border or we can fix it. <laughs> governor, when did compromise become a dirty word? So compromise should be effective. The House has passed an effective border security plan. If, if, if Joe Biden really believes in compromise, he would work with the House chamber. And work with the Republicans in the Senate. Why not pass that bill now? Because the, the Senate bill codifies illegal immigration and actually promotes even more illegal immigration. Governor Abbott has grabbed headlines with controversial moves, including busing migrants to Democrat-led cities to relieve overcrowded border towns. Now he's forging ahead with court battles over buoys in the Rio Grande, razor wire in Eagle Pass, and the new law which would allow local police to arrest migrants for entering Texas illegally. A judge recently wrote, surges in immigration do not constitute an invasion. Isn't that word invasion dangerous, Governor? So the, the word invasion is the word that is used in the United States Constitution. These are people who are coming across the border in violation a federal law in the, in the state of Texas. Meanwhile, the White House has slammed many of his actions here in Texas as political stunts. Fascinating interview. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you so much. And when there are political speeches, there should be vibe checks for voters, right? Well, NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander headed out to a county in Georgia that could be pivotal in this year's election. And that's because it's part of an elite group known as the Deciders. And those seven counties that you're looking at out of more than 3,000 counties in the entire country are the ones NBC News will be following very, very closely to help explain the course of the election. And Blaine joins us now with more. Well, Gotti, I spent the morning here in Gwinnett County actually talking to voters. What's interesting, one thing that stood out to me, of the people that I spoke with, most of them did not watch last night's State of the Union address. So that just kind of tells you the impact that it will have on voters here, or at least gives you a slice or a glimpse into the impact it'll have when you talk about crucial counties like Gwinnett. A couple of things are clear. One, nobody's excited about the choices ahead of them in November, but what they plan to do about it is very different. I spoke with two people who told me that back in 2020, they actually cast a ballot for Joe Biden as president. But this time around, they're planning to either lean for a third party candidate or just stay at home altogether. I spoke with another person who said that she was out there. She was beating the pavement for um, Stacey Abrams in 2022. Now she's trying to convince her friends who were doing the same thing to actually cast a ballot this time around for president. Here's a little bit of what I heard from voters. Take a look. I do believe, um, for me personally, that life begins at um, uh, conception. I think that the president needs to consider that it is circumstantial um, in, in case by case. Sadly, a lot of people don't want to vote, period, because they're not confident in either candidate. Um, and these are people who voted in 2020 yes. for Biden. Yes. And they're telling you now they just don't know if they're going to vote. 
And so, Gotti, just to underscore why this is so important, we're talking about Gwinnett County, of course, in Georgia. Remember, we are looking at almost kind of the curtain raiser of the general election tomorrow when both President Biden and former President Trump hold rallies here in the Peach State. That just underscores the importance of this state when it comes to both of their paths to the White House. But when you talk about winning Georgia, you're really talking about winning counties like Gwinnett, places that are swing counties. If I could just kind of illustrate for you, back in 2008, Barack Obama lost this county by 10 points. Fast forward to 2020, Joe Biden won by 18 points. So we're talking about a place that is growing quickly. It's becoming more diverse. And both Democrats and Republicans really see this as the key to winning Georgia. Scotty. Blaine Alexander, thanks so much. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Later this hour, the U.S. is warning about an attack by extremists that could happen at any moment in Moscow. Matt Bradley has the latest on that. And Houston, we've got a problem. It seems like every day there's a new headline about planes falling apart. Well, you're not wrong if you're thinking that, because coming up, we're going to take a look at the latest one that just happened in Texas. And later this hour, a whale was spotted in New England that hasn't been seen in more than two centuries. We're going to tell you all about it in tonight's edition of Stay Wild. So stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. You know, some of those airdrops of food and supplies to Gaza, well, some of them have turned deadly. We're going to explain that in just a minute. But first, here are some of the other headlines we're following from around the world. Gunmen attacked a school in Nigeria, kidnapping nearly 300 students. That's what the school's head teacher is telling police there. The local reports say it all happened just before school started Thursday morning. Right now, no group has claimed responsibility. The locals say Islamic extremists kidnapped at least 200 people in another part of Nigeria earlier this week. And the U.S. State Department is telling Americans to get out of Haiti, but how Americans are supposed to leave is still up in the air. Since the country's airports remain closed as gangs attacked it last week, the plans are still underway. In fact, a series of gang attacks from last week on government buildings has paralyzed the country and led to a state of emergency. And an update on a story we first told you about last month from Grenada. You might remember the three men who escaped from jail who hijacked a boat of an American couple. Well, they have been charged with murder and rape. Police say the three men likely threw the couple off their boat, then sailed to nearby St. Vincent, where they were captured. And an excessive heat could be causing irreparable damage to Australia's Great Barrier Reef. For the fifth time in eight years, the reef has been experiencing a widespread bleaching event. That's when conditions like unusually warm water turn the normally colorful corals white. It doesn't necessarily kill the coral, but in extreme cases, it can. And in his State of the Union last night, we heard President Biden talk about new U.S. plans to set up a temporary floating dock to get aid into Gaza. That was followed up today with more airdrops of food and supplies, but neither are permanent solutions, and those in Gaza say aid isn't nearly enough. NBC's Richard Engel has more. This is what an aid drop into Gaza is supposed to look like, as today, a Jordanian military cargo plane dropped pallets of food near Gaza City. They fall slowly. But this also happened today. As the pallets are dropped by another aircraft, one of the parachutes on the right of the screen fails to open. The package comes apart in midair, the pieces falling down with heavy thuds. The other pallets also drop very quickly. Palestinian medical officials and witnesses say five people were crushed to death. To establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean. Last night, President Biden announced the U.S. military will build a pier to improve and expand the delivery of humanitarian aid. NBC News has learned it could take up to 60 days for it to be fully operational. But Washington also supplies Israel with weapons. Instead of telling us they will build a port to help us, stop giving the weapons they use to kill us, this man said. We were on an aid drop yesterday as a Jordanian military C-130 flew over northern Gaza. They've just given the signal that they're ready to drop. The pallets carried tens of thousands of meals. Our crew filmed as hungry people went searching for food. As they searched, they approached Israeli troops because that's where the food aid was. Not long after, an explosion can be heard. And an injured man is taken from the area. The Israeli military says its troops have opened fire on those who appear to pose a threat. Gazans face an impossible dilemma. Do nothing and go hungry and maybe starve, 
or search for food at the risk of being shot or hit by raining pallets. Richard Engel, thank you so much for that reporting. And in Moscow, Americans are being warned about a potential terror attack this weekend. The U.S. Embassy is telling U.S. citizens to avoid big gatherings there. And this, as the Russian military says, it stopped a religious attack by Islamic extremists. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley has those details. Yeah, this warning was really ominous and very little explained. We just heard from the U.S. Embassy saying that American citizens should be warned that there could be imminent terror attacks in the next 48 hours. So that includes today, which is over in Russia now, and tomorrow, Saturday. And that this, these could be targeting places where Americans could congregate. Now, this was a very terse statement by the U.S. Embassy. It did say... It did specify including concerts. Um, so this is something that we don't know anything about. We don't know whether this is something that they received from Russian intelligence, whether this was individual monitoring by the United States. We don't know where the threat comes from or where it could strike. And based on NBC's own reporting, the only real connection that we're seeing with other events was that the FSB, Russia's security service, announced that they had foiled a plot by ISIS, also known as Islamic State, their Afghan branch called ISIS Khorasan, from attacking a region or a synagogue in a region in the southwest of Moscow. Uh, they had said that they foiled this plot, uh, and but, you know, there's no real indication that that has anything to do with the U.S. Embassy's warning. So, again, this is very ominous, and there's almost no explanation attached to it. Uh, we're really just going to have to wait until the end of Saturday to see whether this weekend passes peacefully in Russia. Matt Bradley, thanks so much. And coming up, Ethan Crumbly's parents continue to stand trial after he killed four students at his Michigan school. We're going to bring you the latest on that case. But first, take a look at this. Florida is known for all kinds of wildlife, but some people in Temple Terrace, which is located right outside of Tampa, well, they got an unexpected visitor in the middle of the night. Not a gator, but a bull. Imagine waking up and seeing that outside your door. He was just casually chewing on grass when the neighbors called the cops around 2.30 in the morning. Officers were thankfully able to corral him. And for now, Florida's very own Ferdinand was reunited with its owner. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. More on that groundbreaking trial out of Michigan where the parents of a school shooter are facing charges. Maggie Vespa is going to join us there in just a second. But first, let's get to some of the other headlines we're keeping an eye on right now. Five middle school students were expelled in Beverly Hills after they apparently created deep fake nudes of classmates. Last month, they were accused of using generative AI to create those images, which they allegedly shared. No arrests or charges have been reported. Donald Trump is appealing the civil defamation verdict in favor of E. Jean Carroll. Now, the former president posted a $91 million bond to avoid having to pay damages he owes Carroll while he appeals. And that comes just days before he faced a deadline to pay over $83 million in damages. The bond is basically meant to secure that damage award in case his appeal fails. And the U.S. military is saying one of its most troubled aircraft is again cleared for takeoff. They are resuming those V-22 Osprey flights, lifting an order that had grounded most of the fleet. Just months ago, eight airmen were killed when an Osprey helicopter crashed into the sea off the coast of Japan. That was the fourth fatal crash for the Osprey in less than two years. And drug maker Eli Lilly says the FDA has delayed the approval of its Alzheimer's drug. Surprise move will push back the approval decision of the experimental treatment, and it's likely to come next month. Eli Lilly says the drug slowed Alzheimer's progression in a late stage trial. And it is that time again. It's time to spring forward, which of course means we are going to be losing an hour of sleep. Daylight saving time is back this weekend, officially shifting over on Sunday. But on the bright side, more sunlight, I guess. Meanwhile, in Michigan, prosecutors are insisting that the father of the Oxford High School mass shooter could have stopped that rampage. James Crumbly is facing charges of involuntary manslaughter, the same charges his wife, Jennifer Crumbly, was convicted on last month. And both parents were accused of ignoring signs of their son's mental health struggles leading up to that shooting. Today in court, the gun store manager who called James Crumbly a familiar face testified about the day the father and son came into the store to buy a gun. Mr. Crumbly, I asked to see the um, six hour, said he had had his eye on that for quite some time. And just because he is a familiar face to our store, I looked at him and said, you know the drill, I need your license. Um, took that, made copies, 
uh, while he was filling out his um, application. James Crumbly originally bought that gun as a gift for his then 15-year-old son. Just days later, Ethan Crumbly would use it to carry out that deadly shooting at Oxford High School in November of 2021. Four students were killed, and Ethan Crumbly is now facing a life or serving a life sentence in prison. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has more from court today. Gotti, day two of testimony in the trial of James Crumbly, the father charged in his son's mass school shooting, is in the books, with now James Crumbly tonight back behind bars under new restrictions. This after the judge effectively cut off his access to the phone and to what they call electronic messages, after the local sheriff says James Crumbly made threats from inside jail. The sheriff's office declining to say who exactly he threatened when this happened or any content of those threats specifically, but only telling NBC News and also pointing us toward the judge's order that corroborates this, that James Crumbly is now limited to only contacting his lawyer as well as legitimate clergy and then using the Internet, they said, if he wants to to research his case. Again, we've reached out to attorneys on both sides. They remain under gag orders in this case. It is worth noting, as far as who these threats might have been against, that officials have told us in the past, James Crumbly has not been able to directly contact his wife or his son from inside jail, and they tell us all three have been held separately. So take that into account. In the meantime, again, this was day two of testimony, right? We heard from several people, one of them being a computer crimes analyst who testified about text messages that he says Ethan, the son, the convicted school shooter, sent to a friend leading up to this shooting back in 2021. In one such kind of text exchange that was described, he said Ethan sent a video of him holding a gun to his friend and told the friend that his dad had left the gun out, left the gun unsecured. Basically, then James Crumbly's attorney today in cross-examination kind of pushed back at that assessment. And here's part of that exchange. Mr. Crumbly's son said to his friend that his dad left a gun out. Correct. You don't know if that's true. Is that fair? I mean, I don't know why he would lie to his friend that he talks to all the time. You don't know if it's true, correct? From this, it doesn't say that it's true or not, but I don't know why he would lie. The words on the page are the words on the page. Is that that's accurate? That's correct. We saw a lot of exchanges like that today. Uh, just a quick recap, 47-year-old James Crumbly is facing four counts of involuntary manslaughter, one for each of the classmates that his son Ethan killed in the Oxford High School massacre back in 2021. Again, James Crumbly facing the exact same charges that a jury found his wife guilty of here in this courthouse last month. Got it? Maggie Vespa, thanks so much. And still to come, there's a new trend spreading like wildfire on social media, and it's helping Gen Z and millennials land jobs. We're going to tell you all about it, so don't go anywhere. Hey, welcome back. And here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following right now. Cameras caught this rare sighting of a mountain lion late at night in Oceanside, California. This happened earlier this week. You can see right there, that cat just strutting along on the streets. He's even looking through the windows of a movie theater at one point. Police are telling people, obviously, don't approach the mountain lion and to report any sightings of it ASAP. And we've got an update on the Lake Mead Reservoir level story that we told you about a few weeks ago. Federal officials say they are backing a long-term agreement between three southwestern states to conserve water taken from the drought-plagued Colorado River. And they say the move will help California's Lake Mead and other reservoirs from falling to severe low levels in the near future. And Hollywood's biggest awards night is back this weekend, and with it, the return of the bright red Oscars carpet. Oppenheimer is heading into Oscars Sunday as the major favorite, racking up 13 nominations in what could be one of the biggest winners ever. A number of awards are still up for grabs. There hasn't been a clear favorite for best actor or best actress in a lot of the other major award shows leading up to Sunday, so anything can happen. Now, if you've been kind of sketched out by all these plane mishaps recently, well, there's been yet another scare in the sky, except this one happening right as the plane landed. In Houston this morning, a United Airlines jet slid off the runway after some sort of gear collapse. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello has more on what went wrong. Off the runway, tipped over and stuck in the grass, a United 737 MAX 8. Its landing gear collapsed. Flight 2477, Memphis to Houston, touched down just before 8 a.m. Runway 27, 
With another plane following close behind, the pilots were told not to slow too much. Uh, keep your speed up. No, that's true. Okay, you know, 24 7 will do. But the plane slid off a wet runway as it tried turning onto a taxiway. Another United flight close behind ordered to cancel its landing. United 1383, go around. At 2477, I see in the grass rolling the uh, trucks en route. United says no passenger or crew injuries were reported. The runway closed as investigators look into what happened and whether the plane's landing gear failed. It comes one day after this incident in San Francisco. The last departure lost the wheel on departure, so we're going to have to shut the, the runway down. A United 777 headed to Japan lost one of six tires from its main gear assembly as it took off Thursday morning. The tire crashed through a fence, crushing several parked cars. No injuries. Runway 28 right is temporarily closed. The flight then diverted to LAX with investigators looking into how that tire came loose. Ladies and gentlemen, we realize. And United says the flames from that mid-air engine stall on Monday may have happened after the plane's engine ingested bubble wrap debris left on the runway. Every flight landed with passengers safe but shaken. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. Shaken indeed. Tom Costello, thanks so much. And it looks like some good news from today's job report. Roughly 275,000 jobs were added in February of this year. That's better than expected and shows some signs of a strong market. But in the same month, it seems as though layoffs were at their highest for any February since at least 2009. But despite that, it seems like Gen Zers and young millennials are finding ways to land some job security. And NBC's Julie Serkin has more. If you're on social media, chances are you've seen these videos all over your For You page. I'm pretty sure I'm getting laid off today. Job cuts, no matter the industry, can be found all over the headlines. So, to avoid being just another one of the more than 160,000 layoffs this year alone, Gen Z and millennials found a little hack, calling it quits on the private sector and going public. Many looking to lock down government jobs for security. Public service was something I always wanted to do besides the benefits, but also one of the reasons is because you were not going to get laid off versus private sector. 77% of the class of 2024 say they're more likely to apply to a job that promises stability. And that's what a government job offers. We have to have a government. If we don't, our society is in trouble and our democracy as well. So it's not that your jobs are forever necessarily but certainly the organization is there. Salaried workers in the public sector hold their jobs for three more years on average than in private. And the younger generation is beginning to notice. Hashtag government jobs on TikTok has more than 23 million views. We need to start applying to jobs with the federal government. On a popular career site for college kids, federal jobs receive twice as many applications. The paycheck is probably smaller. On average, federal workers earned about 22% less than private sector workers with similar roles. But for many, the benefits are the selling point. Good health insurance, retiring early with a pension. Plus, after a decade, student loans are wiped clean for many. That's a perk nearly 70% say will influence their decisions. And of course, there's the work-life balance. You do your job nine to five and then you can enjoy your life after work and do what you want to do. But right now, less than 8% of federal workers are younger than 30 and nearly half are over 50. The challenge, though, is that the leaders in government don't often prioritize creating the opportunities for young people, ensuring that, that the managers know how to manage uh, Gen Z and millennials. And, and making sure the process itself is not overly onerous. Tamayo says the long process can be a big turnoff. I tell them that it's going to take a minute, and when they say, what do you mean a minute? I'm like, five to six months. And they get very discouraged by it. But for him, it's worth it. You just have to be patient because at the end of the day, you're going to get a secure job where you're not going to get laid off. Troy Serkin, thanks so much. And... You know how many animals have gone extinct? A lot. And there are some that go extinct altogether, and then there are some that are locally extinct, like the gray whale, which was completely wiped from the Atlantic Ocean. And we have to go all the way back to the 18th century to find it, way back in 1725. A guy by the name of Paul Dudley wrote this about whales that could be seen off the coast of New England. In his essay, he noticed one of them having a grayish color. And that 
was the last known documentation of a gray whale in the Atlantic before they went extinct there until at least last week. Scientists from the New England Aquarium spotted a gray whale swimming near the water of Nantucket, Massachusetts, something that hasn't been seen in that area in over 200 years. Uh, gray whales are usually found out here on the west in the Pacific Ocean, but in the last 15 years, five whales have been spotted in Atlantic and Mediterranean waters. The aquarium says this whale is most likely the same whale that was spotted off the coast of Florida last December. So joining us now is biologist and wildlife conservationist Jeff Corwin. Jeff, uh, so this is the same whale? Is this, I mean, I've been told, and I got a chance to go down to Baja, California. I've been told very specifically, all gray whales are Mexican. They're all born in that area. Is this one of those whales that made its way over to the Atlantic somehow? Or are we looking at a whole different set of gray whales in the Atlantic? Good evening, Getty. It is likely the same species of gray whale that you find along the Pacific coast, uh, coastline from Alaska, clear on, clear on down to, to Mexico. And of course, we love seeing them gather in, in Baja, where people can actually interact and experience the wonders of these whales. There's about 14,000 of these gray whales. And historically, they would have been spotted in England two centuries ago or more, they became regionally extinct, which we call extirpated, but because of climate change, because of the warming waters way up north, that ice stretch uh, known as the, uh, the Northwestern Passage has opened up, creating a oh. new navigating exploration opportunity for these incredible marine mammals. Wow, that, that, that is fascinating. So, uh, and speaking of whales, turning gears a little bit, while one whale species seems to be making this comeback or at least uh, veering off because of uh, effects of climate change, another one, the North Atlantic rail, whale, um, that one seems to be going extinct, right? What can you tell us about that and, and what's threatening that whale? Absolutely. So we're actually looking at the, 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 the curtain of extinction closing around the North Atlantic right whale. Uh, there's only about uh, 360 of these whales surviving today, only 70 surviving females. And what's wiping these animals out is they migrate from uh, colder waters in Canada, New England, down to uh, warm waters off of Florida, where they uh, feed there in the winter, then they come up north to reproduce. And as they come up north, they get struck by ships and shipping lanes. They also get entangled in uh, commercial fishing gear. So the great news is that NOAA, uh, the uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, is laser focused on saving the species. And a key component to saving the North Atlantic right whale are sanctuaries. So uh, we have what we call uh, national marine sanctuaries. Think of these as like a national park in a marine environment, but they're managed by NOAA. And we have a sanctuary off New England, a spectacular one known as Stowagon Bank. They head their way to sanctuaries off of Florida. But we're really in a fight to save the species. Females now breed only seven to 10 years. They should be breeding once every three years. The mortality of females has gone from living upwards to 100 years plus to about 45 years. They're in serious trouble. They're not replacing themselves. They're on the brink of extinction. So if we're going to save them, Gaddy, it's going to be today. Thankfully, NOAA's focused in this. Uh, incredible organizations uh, like the uh, National Marine Sanctuary Foundation are working alongside to try to save these species. And, and I mean, you brought up breeding. Uh, I didn't know how to broach this next topic, but I got to You're going to go there, aren't you? <laughs> I have to. I don't even know if we're going to show the picture. Why not? But it's late. I, I, I mean, there's some bed, pictures so. out there of, of whales doing it. It's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty historic picture, from what I understand. Don't look too closely at that one, I guess. Um, oh, you don't have to look closely we? at all. It's all right there. It's stretched <laughs> all the way across my computer screen. I know. Um, sorry. Yeah, uh, we I mean, were, were very... debating on do we blur underwater or not? No, <laughs> What's hey, happening it's here? Nature. <laughs> it's hey, it's nature, right? The birds do it, bees do it, and even <laughs> giant whales. whales do it. So uh, yeah, yeah, they're very randy, um, and they have uh, very rich sexual lives, and they reproduce, and they have courtship, 
And uh, and here we see, you know, pushing other boundaries when it comes to reproductive behavior. So uh, it's pretty incredible. I've actually been there watching whales uh, reproduce there. And I'll tell you what, it's very intimidating to be in a very small boat watching a big whale yeah. having a lot of fun. Uh, I bet. Uh, last question, I promise. There's some talk about using AI to talk to whales, to talk to whales first, right? I I'm not sure if you've seen this. And then there's this whole discussion on, wait, should we, should humans talk to whales and like what the ethical implications of conversing with whales would be? Have you, have you thought about that at all? Well, it is interesting. As we know, cetaceans, which are the whales and the dolphins and the porpoises, are very intelligent. They have big brains. Those brains are uh, they use for navigating. Some of them will use echolocation uh, to actually literally sonar their way through their environments. Those big brain tells us that there's some maybe some complex thought and behaviors going on there, and they do communicate. They have these incredible complex uh, languages that can travel for many miles under the ocean. I believe by better understanding them, having a window into the worlds of communication will give us a better appreciation for them. NOAA is doing a ton of research in this. By better understand whales, we know that we compete with whales with sound. A lot of the mm -hmm. noise pollution we produce impacts the survival of whales. So I say if we can figure out, if we can crack that nut and figure out what these animals are saying, maybe we'll appreciate them more and have better to better tools to protect them. And maybe even give them a little bit more silence. Jeff Corwin, thanks so much Absolutely. for joining us. Uh, next time you go whale watching, we'll learn how to the speak to them and we'll watching. maybe get some information about their love life. There you go, yeah. Next time you're on a G-rated uh, whale watching tour, I'd love to come. Thank you so very much for joining us. And before we go, it is time for the future of everything. And tonight we are talking about the future of the STEM industry. One New York City organization is teaching kids how to code, and we're gonna tell you all about it. We'll be right back. And in the future of everything this Friday, we wanna talk about a very special group that's teaching underprivileged kids how to code. But first, here are some tech headlines we're watching right now. Sam Altman is back on the new board of advisors at OpenAI, an internal investigation chalked up the CEO's ouster back in November to a breakdown in trust between Altman and the old board. And remember filling in all those little bubbles on an answer sheet for the SAT? Well, you might not have to sharpen those old number two pencils anymore because as more universities move away from standardized testing, the SAT is going fully digital. The new pilot version has shorter reading passages, an online calculator, and cuts the exam down to just two hours and 14 minutes. And tonight, we are taking a look at the STEM industry, which has been historically dominated by men and not much diversity. But one group out in New York City is rewriting that code to include more communities where STEM education isn't always available. Our friend and NBC reporter, Maya England, got to spend an afternoon with some Americans who are the next generation of coders. Hey, Maya. Hi, Gotti. Barriers in access to higher education, skilled training, and jobs are just some of the challenges communities of color face trying to enter the STEM field. But Hood Code in New York City is encouraging young coders to look beyond what is and focus on what could be. Take a look. Do you think more kids should learn how to code? Yeah, because if you learn how to code, you can be like an engineer or work at Google and get a um, big job and you can like uh, live your life. Change the world. The tech industry has a long-standing problem with diversity and Jason Gibson is trying to change that. I wanted to make it easily accessible to the families that live here. That change is starting in rooms like these here in New York. More specifically, the New York City Housing Authority, or NYCHA for short. It's the largest public housing authority in the country with more than half a million residents, a quarter of them under the age of 18. And Jason wants to give all these kids new opportunities. The goal is to have hood coal running simultaneously in each one after school and during the summer, every day. Hood Code is a nonprofit that began in 2019. Since then, Gibson and his team of instructors, mostly high school students and recent college grads, have helped many of these kids realize that a career in tech is not out of reach. 
I didn't have a computer till basically high school, and I didn't even know that jobs in coding like existed. I really did not know that it was like a field that was accessible to us. In some ways, neither did Gibson. So I came up with the idea during my incarceration in 2017. You know, I've always been a entrepreneur. Gibson says he thought maybe a career in the tech industry could have kept him out of the criminal justice system. And he used his entrepreneurial spirit to get others on board, sponsors and community members, to make sure his program would be free for students and a paid job for tutors. The easiest part about coding is um, the fun. The best thing about coding is that you get to use your imagination. It feels like a game. But if these kids do decide to go in tech, there are still challenges ahead. Black employees made up 8% of the IT workforce in 2022, according to the IT trade group CompTIA. And the numbers at some of the biggest tech companies like X, Meta, and Google show similar gaps. And then hit, you can hit copy. Shigo, one of Hood Code's tutors, says these kids have already been through obstacles and are not discouraged. The passion, the drive that these kids have is something that you don't see in like your ordinary, ordinary kid because I know that they had to work 10 times harder to be here. And now with $200,000 from the David Prize, a no strings attached award given to New York based innovators, Hood Code is more determined than ever to make real change. What do you wish more people knew about the students coming into this program? Um, I wish people knew about some of the creativeness that the students have, the ambitions that the students have, the abilities that the students have, and the interests. Uh, I think people kind of have stereotypes or, you know, their own beliefs about just neighborhoods like these in general, and a lot of times they're wrong. So although Jason doesn't code himself, he says his goal is to get hood code in every NYCHA neighborhood as soon as possible so these students can have more opportunities for their future. Gotti? Such a great story. Maya Aiklin, thank you so much. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here Monday. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.